All right, everyone, open your Bibles with us to the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4. If you're new with us, let me just remind you quickly that most of our mainline scholars think Ephesians was not written by Paul, even though there are numerous references to Paul. Our problem is that in our modern parlance, plagiarism is a bad thing. Uh, This is not plagiarism, it's not copying, but using someone else's name uh, today is considered untruthful somehow. That was not true in biblical times. And I've pointed out to you any number of times that the book of Deuteronomy got into the Torah because the priests who suddenly produced it for King Josiah convinced him that Moses had written Deuteronomy. Uh, The best Jewish scholars today, the best Christian scholars today are convinced Moses didn't write any of the Torah and he certainly didn't write Deuteronomy. That the other four scrolls were written long before Deuteronomy, that Deuteronomy was not written until Uh, shortly before these priests brought it in to King Josiah to attempt meaningful reform, uh, that the southern tribes hopefully uh, would turn their lives around, their their king would become a just and generous and benevolent leader of God's people. And it succeeded, as you recall, for a time when we were going through the great prophets, Uh, Josiah did believe Moses wrote it. He took it seriously, therefore, and uh, attempted meaningful reform. And he was a good king. And all of a sudden, another one of those periods where the Egyptians wanted to take over this main trade route that ran along the Mediterranean Sea. It was called by the Romans later the Via Maritima, the way of the sea. And... uh, the Egyptians could come very fast uh, right, up, right up that road. They had charioteers. There was a big battle at a place you know well called Megiddo, from Armageddon, and uh, Josiah was killed by the Egyptians in a battle at Megiddo. But the point is, they, they didn't mean to desecrate Moses' name or to cheapen it. In fact, they hoped that something they had produced Uh, might be good enough that Moses would have been pleased that it had been produced somehow in his name. So scholars believe that the person who wrote Ephesians is not trying to deceive you, that he's writing not really to you and me. That wasn't the original purpose. He certainly didn't think of himself as writing scripture. There were no scriptures yet, except the 39 scrolls of the Hebrew Bible, Uh, So he didn't think of himself as writing scripture. He was trying to get people to take his writings seriously and thought perhaps they would if he claimed, you know, Paul had these words for you. But the things that he addresses, his working vocabulary, even though in English it may seem to sound like Paul, in Greek when there might be two words that could be translated the same thing in English, uh, Paul uses one and this author uses the other. So The working vocabulary is not exactly that of Paul. So, Dr. Marcus Borg, whom I told you about a few weeks ago, who is an acknowledged scholar, has simply done what most mainland scholars have known about forever, and that is to actually publish uh, the Christian scriptures in the order in which they were written. So, you know, if you wanted to buy this book, and I'm not encouraging you to, He calls it the evolution of the word, and uh, he believes Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians is the oldest material, and then moves on down to the last thing written. And if you remember, and I'll remind you of this list as we go along, uh, we're going to find that, of course, John didn't write 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Peter didn't write 1st and 2nd Peter, and Paul almost for sure didn't write 1st and 2nd Timothy either that the last thing Paul wrote was Romans uh, in about the year 60, and we think he died probably about the year 65. So, with that said, it doesn't mean this is an unimportant work. It's a very important work. Important enough that when uh, the holy writings were being gathered, many were rejected 
as not being sufficiently inspired of God, these 27 things were accepted as being holy writ forever and ever uh, within the Christian faith, and Ephesians is certainly one of those. All right? Let's pray. God, help us understand what this author has to say. Our earlier mothers and fathers decided this was certainly inspired by you into the heart and mind of a believer in you who wanted desperately to communicate to the church of a time after Paul's death and wanted his writing to be taken seriously, um, wanted people to pay attention that he believed what you had inspired him to write was significant enough that we believe he was willing to affix Paul's name to it uh, to get it read. And we are reading it and we want to understand it. In Christ's name we offer our best effort. Amen. Chapter 4. I, therefore, prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now, when it says prisoner of the Lord, it can mean two things, of course. One is that writers in our Christian scriptures use the word doulos or douloi many times, usually translated servant or slave. The Wesleys picked up on this Charles in one of his hymns. Make me a captive, Lord, he wrote, and then I will be free. Make me a captive, Lord, and then I will be free. And so in one sense, we are prisoners of the Lord. That is, we are, again, it comes from the same idea of we are convicted or convict of the truths we believe God was imparting to us in Jesus Christ. And so in that sense, we are prisoner. But it also could have mean, of course, that there were numerous Christians who were thrown into jails and prisons because of what they were teaching and preaching. So, you know, could be flesh and blood behind bars. It could be I'm a prisoner for the Lord's sake or I'm, I'm convicted by what I know about Jesus Christ and therefore imprisoned by what I know is true and I can only tell you or write for you what I know. Okay, so then he goes on with some really wonderful words here. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in agape, willingness to put ourselves out for each other, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of shalom. Now those a lot of words strung together there, but most of the scholars whom I know who've written significant works on Ephesians say that this sentence may be the real heart of this whole letter, uh, and that is wanting Christians to be together, to be united in their efforts. And here we are 2,000 years later, and we're not united. We're not united. And there was a time 30 years ago when the ecumenical movement was stronger, when uh, Christians were really trying to cooperate much more aggressively with each other, I can remember a time when the Oklahoma Conference of Churches was stronger than it is now. Um, The World uh, Council of Churches was stronger than it is now. The National Council of Churches stronger than it is now. Uh, And I think part of it was that we realized it took us years to get two groups to become one, if possible, And often when you join two to make one, you had three more off splits from it. Uh, It simply didn't work. Uh, There were constantly people, uh, you know, moving away, starting anew. And it's more the case today than ever. Uh, Anybody, you know, with 50 cents can rent space and set up a church and call himself or herself a minister and start holding services. So uh, we're never going to be one in name. I mean, we can be one in name Christian, but certainly not in any kind of denominational uh, structure. In the Methodist Church, there have been significant efforts just to try to get all the offshoots of Methodists back together. Uh, Particularly uh, those who broke away from the Methodist Church over racial matters. 
Uh, you, we have right here in Tulsa a church that's called an AME church, African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, there are CME churches, and originally they were called that because they were colored Methodist Episcopal churches uh, when that word was still more commonly used. So the CME ch- branch is strong, and the AME church is strong, not nearly as strong as United Methodist. I was at a, an, a, a general conference in Cleveland, Ohio, just a few years ago, uh, Gail and I, where we went through a long service one night, about three and a half hours of you know trying to worship together and we had a bishop of the AME church and a bishop of the CME church and so on all on stage and all leading in worship and we all knew there's no way they're going to rejoin us at this point they are not Um, they're afraid they would lose their bishops they wouldn't have as many uh, if, if, if they joined us but you know the big problem probably the pension funds you know, I mean, to get down to it, uh, pension funds and medical care policies and so on. I mean, just the tedium of trying to put denominations together, even those with a common background of having all come from John and Charles Wesley's reform movement in England. Uh, it, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So how do we achieve unity? We're not going to do it in name. We're not all going to be the same name and denomination. We are in national polls and everything the same as far as being Christian, followers of Christ, and that may be the best we can hope for. But the really important thing, of course, is that we be kind to each other, that we do what these words suggest, that we be uh, we come to each other in humility and gentleness and patience and agape. But unity is the theme of this writing, most scholars are convinced. He goes on with this thought. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. See, this sounds a lot like Paul in his first letter to the church at Corinth, where they are quarreling among themselves as to who has the most important gift of the Holy Spirit. And some speak in ecstatic tongues called glossolalia, and some seem to have a special gift of laying on hands, and people seem to get physically better, even well, in some cases. Others have wonderful gift of speech or teaching ability, And Paul went into that controversy by saying, you know, a body has many different parts. Can a hand say to an eye, you're unimportant? Can an arm say to a leg, you're unimportant? No, we need two hands, we need ten fingers, we need two feet and ten toes and two legs and two arms and a head and so on. We need each other. And different Christians are gifted differently what we contribute to the body, what we can do, um, each should add to the other. In our church, we have some people that are glad to be teachers. They're willing you know, to teach for us Sunday after Sunday, whether some say, well, I, I would love to teach five-year-olds or seven-year-olds or teenagers. Others, no, no, I don't want to teach children and youth, but I could teach adults. And then we have others that would be frightened to death to teach But they love to use a chainsaw when there's been a tornado somewhere, or we've had damage at Camp Egan from a flood water a couple of years ago, and boy, we had Boston Avenueers rushing down there with chainsaws and and cutting up all that debris and, and moving it and hauling it and piling it up and so on. So there are many different gifts, and some do one thing very well and some another, and it's not fair for one to say to the other, What you bring is unimportant, or what I bring is more important than what you bring. Uh, Each of us brings something. God has gifted all of us in one way or the other. Okay, each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive, 
he gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? Okay, let's stop and think about that just a second. Remember that throughout the Bible, start to finish, people believed the earth was flat. They were not inspired of God to know that the earth was round. We kid ourselves if we believe so. They didn't know it was round. They thought it was flat. They really thought they were the center of the universe. They thought everything moved around them. It seemed to when they observed the the patterns of the stars and so on. Everything seemed to move around them. They had no idea they were moving around a star that we call the sun, that they were turning, spinning every 24 hours as they went. And the fact that they were spinning every 24 hours and taking 365 and a quarter days to make a circuit around this star, and that this star was itself moving through space, carrying all of us along with it, made everything else seem to be moving around us. But in fact, the other things were not moving around us. We were not the center. Okay. They also had come to believe, particularly in the time of the Christian scriptures, the thought processes were the Greek thoughts. Because 500 years before these writings, you had Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle. And these fellows were brilliant in their own time. They believed the earth was flat. They believed there was water up above, and they believed there was water down below. And they buried people when they died, if not digging a hole and often putting them in caves, rolling over stones to keep out animals, predators of any kind. So we have incorporated this thought into our faith statements. What does it mean to say that Christ descended into death? We mean he was really dead from Friday till Sunday. Really dead. That the only hope Jesus, the person Jesus had, was in God, as is our hope. Would God bring him to new life? Would he not? He was absolutely dependent upon God. And God did, of course, bring him to new life. Why seek ye the living among the dead? The messenger said on Sunday morning, he's not here, he has been raised. Uh, So, but this descending, you see, was that period. And also, tradition then came to understand this as being well. He preached to those even in death, so to speak. There was, as he had died, so others die. I have a funeral, another one, tomorrow afternoon. And one of the, one of the scriptures that we often read is where uh, Jesus is quoted as saying, uh, I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. I was really, really dead. And so those whom you love who are really dead unless God makes them alive again, uh, can be trusted. He can be trusted. He will make your mother, your sister, alive again. Uh, Okay, let's go on a little bit farther here. I think think the wind blew my page here. Ah, Here we are. Thanks. Thanks. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, this really sounds like 1 Corinthians, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Often you hear bishops preach from this text when they're ordaining young clergy, uh, you know, trying to launch them in in the proper way, help them understand that one may be stronger in one area, one in another, but All of us together, hopefully, can help build up the church. It's all about making the body of Christ stronger and more effective in the world. It goes on, until all of us come to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. That is, we become more and more and more like Him, hopefully, prayerfully, 
We must no longer be children. Paul uses that language too. You ought to be big grown-up Christians by the time he continued to write to the Corinthians. Instead, we're still milk-feeding you. You haven't grown very much. You're still like babes. So we must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love. And what that means, of course... You remember we went through a phase in our country a few years ago where uh, you're supposed to just speak the truth, period. Just uh, just speak the truth. And people were saying really hateful things to each other that they didn't forget. Do you forget people who criticize you? It's really hard to forget criticism. I mean, constructive criticism is what somebody else gets, not what you and I get. You know, we don't like to be fussed at. Uh, We don't like people criticizing. Um, One of the smarter things I heard out of the Richard Burton, Elizabeth Taylor era was that when somebody asked about their fighting, they said, well, we don't criticize in each other what that person cannot change. And uh, Elizabeth Taylor was asked more about that. And she said, well, Richard Burton had bad complexion from when he was a teenager. He had battled acne and so on, and he had scarring in his face. And she said, if I were to point that out in a, in a fight between the two of us, that's something he can't change, nothing he can do about that. And that's really not fair to mention something that he cannot change, nothing he can do about that. So here this author is wiser and doesn't say, just blurt out the truth, whatever it may be. Uh, Little children do that. Older people sometimes do that. The sensor on their brain finally goes to sleep and they just blurt things out. Uh, Spend any time around a nursing home or retirement facility and you discover that older people can be very blunt with each other, can't they, Virginia? They forget to be nice. Gail and I've left. Uh, our our son Trey is just, you know, he's just the sweetest guy. He really is. Everybody that knows Trey loves Trey. He's a he's a has God birthed him that way. But even he, one one year just before Christmas, Gail was needing to shop for our daughter. They were little, and we went into the big downtown Foley's department store. I still remember it. It was just a block from First Methodist Church where I was on staff. And so uh, we were in this huge, big Foley's department store. It was about 10 stories tall. And, you know, just floor by floor by floor. And Gail's trying on clothes, and our daughter was one of them. No, she didn't like that. No, she didn't like that. She didn't like that. So this went on for a while. And the woman attending us was rather large. And Trey is finally bored to death. He's a little bitty fella, and he's crawling in and under the clothes. And all of a sudden, this woman said, Well, how are you today, young man? And he looked up at her and said, Is your name Fat Albert? (laughs) Because that was a character he had seen on television. And she sort of resembled Fat Albert. And she smiled and said, Well, no, but I sort of resemble him, don't I? So... Uh, that doesn't help for us to say those kind of things to people. It doesn't help. And so this author understands that and says, speak the truth in love. And that's a, that's a real limiter there. Are you really trying to help that person? And be careful when you say yes. Are you really trying to help? Are you saying in a, in a way that the person can do better, get better, be better? Or is it just to somehow vent your own feelings at the moment? Speak the truth in love. We must grow up in every way into him who is the head. That is, to be more and more like Christ. When you say this truthful thing, is it really to help this person or not? It is Christ from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love, in agape. Is everything imaginable being done 
for the well-being of the other. For the well-being of the other. Not for making ourselves feel better about something. Isn't it amazing how differently you get treated when you call somebody by name? When you're in a store, even if they know you don't know them, you're reading the name right off of their badge, they start to act differently. It's so easy, you know, yesterday we were having our usual Saturday lunch Mexican food fix, and a young man came to be our waiter, whom we had not had at this restaurant before. I had not seen him before. And he said his name sort of quickly and had a little Spanish accent, and I didn't quite get it. And I said, sorry, I didn't quite, and he said the name again. And so I said, oh, thank you. Well, that, that's a very fine name. So every time he came back to the table with, you know, Diet Cokes or whatever it was, I would simply say, oh, thank you, thank you, call him by name, call him by name, call him by name. He's a person then. He's a person, and the fact that he has a name causes me to treat him differently, and it causes him to respond differently. It just works better. My brother and I were talking about this at Thanksgiving, and this is something he's worked really hard on as well. He's a banker in our hometown, and uh, of course knows a lot of people in our small town, but was saying, even if he's in Shreveport with his wife doing it at Longview or some other place, how differently you get treated when you call somebody by name. She's a person who's checking out your groceries. He's a person who's helping you do this. Yesterday I was looking for something in a, in a store, and Gail was, had gotten tired of looking at that point, and she was, said she'd just wait in the car. And uh, I knew that what I was asking for, they probably weren't going to have. But I saw this young lady at a register, and I saw her. I could read her name from a little way off. And I said, Samantha, yes, sir. And I said, I'm looking for something I can't find. But immediately, she gave me her full attention, you know. And she had to know. I didn't really know who she was. I didn't know her. She didn't know me. But... I called her name just because I read it off of her badge ten feet away. And when I got closer to her and started explaining, she really concentrated. She didn't have it, but she gave me two or three good ideas about where I might have found it just because for a moment I treated her as if she were a person uh, and that she might be able to help me. And uh, she really tried hard to do that. Now this I affirm and insist on in the Lord you must no longer live as the Gentiles live in the futility of their minds. Okay, stop a second. What is this author saying? Here again, this is things like this caused, have caused some through the centuries to think Paul did write this because he had a miserable experience in Athens. Remember? He had a miserable experience in Athens. Uh, he didn't spend any time there. He didn't. He, uh, he just one of his least successful uh, times ever. He had spent most of his life, adult life, after he became a Christian, in Asia Minor. Most of it in Asia Minor. And finally he felt God had a vision, he said, in the night. Somebody saying, come over and help us in Macedonia. And he crossed over the Straits of Bosphorus into Europe. Had a miserable experience in Philippi. They beat him, put him in jail. Earthquake in the middle of the night. He escaped and went on down the Roman road, the Via Ignatia, to Thessalonica. Most scholars believe his first letter back to Thessalonica is the oldest thing from Paul we have. These detractors from Philippi followed him down the road when they heard which way he had gone, started making trouble for him there. He went on down to Berea. They were right behind him, so he went south to Athens. And he climbed up on Mars Hill. Some of you have been to Athens. When you're looking at the Parthenon, at the top of the hill, right down below, the side you climb up, 
right down below those steps is a little marble hill called Mars Hill. And it's really slippery. It's been climbed on so much for hundreds and hundreds of years that it's easier to get up than it is to get down. It's really, really slippery marble. But Paul climbed up on that little hill and started talking. The Greeks believed in sharing, you know, sort of like Hyde Park in London. Hey, get on your soapbox and tell us what you think. And so Paul tried hard to reason, to show them how brilliant he was in the writings of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And he turned out to them to be just one among many philosophers who'd come their way. And they were soon bored and walked away. So what did he do in other places he went? He told his story. He told his story. I mean, that's... College professors may deal with the text. I think there's a difference in being a preacher. Because I think ultimately, at least when I hear somebody preach, I either want to know what's happened to him or her, or even if they've just seen a painting, how did they react to that painting? If they've read a book, how did they react to that book? How did they react to a movie they'd seen? Because even that tells me something about the speaker. It may be mostly about the painting, but it's how that person was affected by the painting, which gives you a chance, you see. This morning while I was shaving, people on television were still debating the election. What was the most important reason Romney didn't get elected? You know what they finally came to? That there definitely were difference of ideas. But these people said, most Americans never really connected with George Romney. I mean, Mitt Romney, sorry. George was his father. With Mitt, they didn't feel like he really understood where they were. He didn't have a story. Uh, when Rick Santoris was running strong, because he could talk about the steel mills of, of Pennsylvania and the father who worked in the mills, and people got the idea. Politically, Rick may not have been where they were at all, but he was a real person to them. See? He was a real person to them. First time I ever heard Oral Roberts in person. He came to our First Methodist Church in Houston. I'll tell you this story. I, I was really, frankly, very disappointed Charles Allen had invited him. I'd seen Oral Roberts praying, and he seemed to have sort of an angry kind of demeanor on television when I'd seen him many, many years ago. And I thought, why did Dr. Allen invite Oral Roberts to come and preach at the First Methodist Church in Houston? And then Dr. Allen said, they're coming in on Saturday afternoon. He played golf every Saturday. You pick them up at the airport. I had a wife and three little kids that I wanted to be with on Saturday afternoon, but I went to the airport to pick up Oral and Evelyn Roberts, Richard and his first wife, Patty. That's how long ago it was. I picked up the four of them, drove them to the hotel. But I heard Oral three times the next day, twice in the morning and once at night. And I sat there mesmerized. He was very persuasive in person very warm very warm my first Sunday here he and Evelyn were sitting about there fifth or sixth row right there my first Sunday and when they came out they were remembering that I gave them a tour of the Astrodome when it was new that weekend they were in Houston I took them on a tour of the Astrodome because they wanted to see it I spent some time with them and the next day on Sunday I had more time you know, I was to pick them up at the hotel and take them back and pick up their luggage and get them to the airport and all that sort of stuff. And I got to know them a little bit more. I saw Oral at Houston that day. And even though I loved Dr. Charles Allen, you know, he was sort of my spiritual father, my preacher father. 
Charles Allen was very confident when he was at the pulpit. But he didn't like being down among the folk. He didn't like it. And on Sunday morning, I would see him, and somebody would walk up to him, and he would stick out his hand, and he would already be looking over here, and you know, like this. I watched him seven years. That's the way he did it. Oh, how are you? Have you been? <laughs> Not Oral Roberts. When Oral Roberts, I saw him out here in the halls of our church when he and Evelyn would come. Those first years I was here, they came fairly often. And I saw them. And it didn't matter who walked up to him. For a few moments, he was looking you right to the back of your eyeballs. Every time. Every time, when he walked up to speak to somebody, he looked to the back of your eyes. And when Oral Roberts talked about being poor, you knew he knew what he was talking about. He came from nowhere. He came from nothing. And Oral Roberts remembered what that was like. To be sick. Maybe deathly sick. And have no money. Richard tried to be his dad, still trying to be his dad. But Richard didn't know poor. He never was poor. He grew up playing golf at Southern Hills Country Club, driving Mercedes Benz. So when he told his dad's stories, they didn't ring true, because they weren't his stories. They weren't his stories. He hadn't been there. It's only if you've been there, you know. Well, I think Paul got out of his element on Mars Hill. He even observed, wow, you've, you've got gods and gods and more gods here, and even one monument dedicated to a god you don't know, just to be sure you cover them all. They were bored with Paul. They turned and walked away. So he hightailed it over to Corinth. He never went back to Athens. And he got back to telling his story. I was a persecutor of the early believers. One day, I went all the way to Damascus, searched them out, put them in jail. Suddenly, it's blinding light struck to the ground. And it registered, see? Even if people hadn't had that experience, they could tell it was genuine. It was genuine. And they listened. It's pouring out his heart. So, this author, like Paul, thought there are people that play mind games like the Greeks. And there are others of us who can connect on a different level, a feeling level. When I first uh, came to Tulsa, Dr. Virginia Gray wanted me to go with her out to Oral Roberts University one night. They were having Dr. Lyman Coleman. Did you ever meet him, David? Dr. Lyman Coleman. I didn't know him. I had only heard the name. He was from California, but he was doing a seminar out at Oral Roberts University. And Virginia knew about him, and she she said, you know, if you want to get to know the city, you need to know the Oral Roberts uh, community too. And so I went with her that Friday night and Saturday. Lyman Coleman was amazing, I thought. He was producing a whole uh, series of Sunday school books for different age levels, but all of the scriptures were relational. How does this affect you? What does that say about you? And we were put into small groups out at the university that Friday night. But the exercises he had come up with, I mean, I remember a simpler thing is, when I was five years old, my favorite place to buy candy was. Now, most anybody could talk about that. When I was five years old, my favorite place to buy candy was what? Go around the circle, 
And so you found out, well, this person grew up in a city. They went to Brussels Stover. Uh, this person grew up in the country. There's a little place down there by the Sabine River where you, you, know, you could get little butter, uh, banana squares for a penny apiece. Remember those, Doctor? You know, little peanut butter logs for a penny apiece? I remember that. But as you went around the table, you know, or when I was in the fourth grade, our family car was a... Oh, well, we had an old Ford. We had an old Chevy. We had a pickup. Well, we had a Cadillac, somebody might say. Well, with these exercises, wow, within an hour, hour and a half, you knew a lot about everybody at the table, and nobody had felt really threatened. You'd just been asked to talk about things you knew about, relational things. What was happening to you when you were five? What was happening to you when you were 10, when you were 12, when you were 15? You see? Okay. You tell your story. Finally, the only story we have is our story. I mean by that, how God has impacted our lives. Where were you first aware of God's presence in your life or God's grace reaching out to you? When, when was that first time when you were in college or when you did this or you did that, whatever? Hmm? Okay. I don't mean to be, I don't, I don't say about Richard Roberts what I just said to you because I don't really mean to be critical I think he's tried really hard to be his dad. I think he's tried really hard. But he's not his dad. He doesn't have the same set of experiences. And Mitt Romney, and I know most Oklahomans, most of us voted for Mitt Romney, but I think there was a disconnect there. A disconnect. He'd grown up in an entirely different world from the one most of us grew up in. Um, that group, there are not as many of them as there are this group down here. Uh, not as many of them. And it was the same kind of thing we had with the first President George Bush. I remember when he went in a supermarket to be a common man one day and he didn't know how much a loaf of bread was. Didn't have a clue how much a loaf of bread was because he hadn't been in a grocery store in years. Okay? So it's hard to identify, you know, with somebody like that. You keep reading stories that when Mitt Romney's got so many houses and the latest one, he's got so many cars, he has to have an elevator to take his cars up to the second floor garage. Not many Americans can identify with that. Just a few. Not too many. Not too many. And so there was a disconnect. Romney's story wasn't, wasn't the story of the majority of the Americans. It was different. It was different. Okay, so this writer is talking about playing mind games here. The way the Greeks play these mind games um, is not our way here. Okay, what verse am I on now, Virginia? <laughs> 18, okay. Yeah, the futility of their minds, that's it. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance and hardness of heart. They think they're so smart, and they're not so smart. They've lost all sensitivity, have abandoned themselves to licentiousness, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. That's not the way you learned Christ. For surely you have heard about him and were taught in him as truth is in that flesh and blood person, Jesus, you were taught to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its lusts, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, to clothe yourselves with the new self, credited according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And here there are two wonderful words. Righteousness, you remember, means right standing. So true right standing, you don't get to boast and say, I deserve to be loved. True righteousness, right standing with God is to know that God has loved you just as you are. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, O Lamb of God, I come. Okay, and if I do that, I can stand right with God. By His grace, a gift to me that I've received. 
that I've opened my heart. I've opened the door. I've begged him. Yes, please, love me. I need to be loved by you. Okay. We stand right with God. Then we stand right with others. And the Bible is very clear about this. Both Jews and Christians, you do agape. Agape is not the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word is chesed. It's steadfast, never failing love. It's agape in Greek. A conscious decision of the mind to will the good of the other. To will the good of the other. Are you really doing this, really saying this, to help the other? That's the key. And then it says holiness. And we know this word. Holiness means set apart, set apart. And this comes again right out of Judaism. Way back there in Leviticus, in things priestly. You are to be a set-apart people as you worship a set-apart God. And this set-apart God meant he wasn't made of gold, silver, bronze, fancy woods, fancy stones, stained glass. No, he isn't a snowflake. He isn't a beautiful falling autumn leaf. He's none of those things. He is over and above and before all of those things. All of those things may show us some little glimpse of his handiwork, but they are not God. God is the set-apart one. He's the holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy other one who put everything else into movement, who spoke and caused everything else to begin its movement. That one. So we're supposed to be set-apart not, not that God loves us more, no, no, but that we are trying desperately to act more like him, to do things his way. If we ever get that right, doing things his way, everything falls into place. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth in love, he's told us, to our neighbors, for we are members of one another, I told you way back when Trey graduated from SMU, Mr. Lara of the McNeil Lara Report was the was the keynote was the commencement speaker, and I remember the speech well. Trey probably does too. Mr. Lara said, "I want to talk 15 minutes about dishonesty," and he said, "The one thing that I think is missing more than anything else in Washington is honesty." He said, even if one senator speaks the truth to another when they walk out on the sidewalk and meet the news media, they lie. They lie about what they just said to that other person at lunch or, you know, over a cup of coffee. They lie. They lie. They lie, he said. They don't, they don't speak truth to each other. And so how could they possibly trust each other? They tell you one thing, they walk right out and tell a news media person something entirely different. Truth is supposed to be one of the marks of being a Christian. Be angry, but do not sin. So you can get upset about injustice, things that are not fair, not right. Put that anger into constructive work to try to make things better. Try to make things better. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not make room for the devil, the liar, to come into your life. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them work and work honestly with their own hands so as to have something to share with the needy. Once you work and there's enough for you, you share with those who don't have enough. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for Building up, the old King James word was edification, for building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear, not hatefulness, not bitterness, grace. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Let's stop there a moment. The seal of the Holy Spirit. We talk about that more, I hope at Boston Avenue than when I arrived. And one of the reasons we've added this chiming up in the ceiling is to remind us of the Holy Spirit. 
remind us. Again, last month when we had confirmation, uh, Debbie Peterson and her team had made this clear to the confirmands, and then I reminded them again the, the, the Sunday night that I answered all the questions they had written for me, and they didn't have to sign their names. They all had three by five cards. They could ask me any question they wanted to about their faith or about me personally. Um, and I told them then, and in the morning of their confirmation, when I rushed from this class down to have my picture made with them, I said, one last thought here. Remember the chime. Remember the chime. When the chime sounds and my hands are on your head, Paul told us that the Holy Spirit is trying to whisper to your deepest heart, I know you. I know you. You're my daughter. You're my son. I'm so glad you've taken this next big step. This is the next big step. When we come to communion, the same. We hear the chime. We hear the chime. Proper prayers have been offered. Forgiveness promised. And now the crucified and raised, resurrected one has come to the table, waits for you. So in your baptism, we've prayed that the Holy Spirit would whisper to your deepest spirit. So you've been marked with the seal. The Holy Spirit has marked you that you got a ticket uh, to be in the presence of the Almighty. By His grace, you've received His gift. Okay. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. And then he sort of sums up here, even though the people that did the versification, who put in chapter and verse, they sometimes didn't get it right. They, you know, chop this up when it shouldn't be. So I think in your, in your, I know in the New Revised Standard Version it just carries right on here because the thought should be carried on. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children live in agape as Christ had agape for us and gave himself up for us and in this fragrant offering and sacrifice, you and I don't think of it that way, but remember that when in the old sacrificial system animals were offered, they didn't burn up the whole animal. They usually burned up the innards, the offal. They took out the innards, and, but it gave that barbecue kind of smell. They thought, as good as that smells to humans, it must smell wonderful to God, too. This wafting up, and then the meat was sold in the market right down the street. Or, I remember when Gail and I were in, uh, on the island of Sicily, where her grandparents came from, at, down at Syracuse. And down at Syracuse, there was a, 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 a marble a, a park with much marble outcropping and so on. And we were told at one time one of the leaders of Sicily uh, wanted to, you know, establish goodwill with all the people there. And so hundreds of cattle uh, were brought and the offal taken and they were offered up as sacrifice. This was back in their pagan days. It was offered up and the smoke wafted up and then everybody enjoyed the rest of the animal, the barbecue, as a gift from the king of Sicily. Uh, so here, this fragrant, this wonderful fragrance of sacrifice, but not of dead animals, of course. In Christianity, it's not the dead animals. Uh, it Christ's willingness to be our sacrifice, his willingness must have pleased God more than any sacrifice ever given before that Jesus did it right. He got it right from the start to the finish. He got it right. And it must have pleased God very, very much. Okay. Anybody have a question? All right. I'm going to mark down next Sunday, second Sunday in Advent, Ephesians 5, and we'll start with verse 3. And we'll have 26 Sundays to go. Okay.
Okay. That's right. Don't rush off.